Uh, and so now we have uh, Giovanni Lesna, uh, who will be with us uh, as a follow-up to talk about EPI economy and financial services. Uh, hello, how are you? Hi, I'm great. Thanks, and you? Yeah, we're doing really well. Uh, can you can you speak again just to check your microphone? Uh, can you hear me clearly? Testing one, two, three. Yeah, yeah, that's clear now. Perfect. So, yeah, the stage is yours for uh, twenty minutes plus five minute questions. Let's uh, let's have a uh, understanding about what you're doing in the uh, financial services. Excellent. Thank you so much for, for that. Um, I think uh, a lot of the speakers before have also uh, made uh, laid the foundation for this presentation. So, so far, really interesting conference and, and we're really excited to be here. So my name is uh, Giovanni Lesner. I'm from uh, API3 and also representing our partner uh, company, which is the Open Bank Project. And today we're going to be discussing the API economy and financial services. So just a bit about my background, um, I am the enterprise lead at API3 uh, with partnerships. So we deal quite extensively with Web 3.0, as well as uh, the Open Bank project working with open banking APIs. Just in terms of the agenda, I just thought I'd just uh, map it out quickly just for, for the audience. We're just going to discuss, uh, obviously, the hypes, benefits, and risks of the API economy, as well as open financial services as it pertains to open finance, open banking, open insurance, and healthcare and APIs. And as I mentioned, I think a lot of the, the framework has been laid uh, from previous speakers, excellent conference. Um, and then we're going to move into uh, the open bank project as well as API 3, how we are connectors in the API economy and how that fits into, into various business models, as well as then the Q&A. So I'll just be doing 10 minutes for one and two and three 10 minutes with five minutes for, for Q&A. So what is the hype in the API economy? You know, so if we look at the, the Gartner hype cycle, we're actually in the slope of enlightenment. And, and what that is, is that more and more instances of this technology can benefit from enterprises starting to, to crystallize and understand uh, the use of APIs. So we're seeing a, a lot of growth there. So we can already see just from news headlines, Salesforce, you know, 6.5 billion um, acquisition of, of MuleSoft, Visa, 5.3 billion for Played, Google acquiring Apigee for 625 million, and Kong um, sitting at a 1.4 billion valuation. So we just have to look at the Uber app as, as an example of, of how the, this technology has matured and how we're utilizing all of these um, as basic the building blocks. So if we look at even McDonald's uh, partnering up with Uber Eats, if they had to go and create that whole infrastructure, it would take them a long time to get to market. But they were able to turn that around uh, with quite a you know low amount of resources and a quick uh, amount of time. So you see in the in the in the Gartner hype cycle, we've obviously you know hit hit the peak um, of inflated expectations, and now we're just moving away um, into the sl slope of enlightenment when it comes to the API economy. So what is the API economy? I think a lot of um, you know our, our viewers today attending the conference would like to know what it means. But in essence, it's you know it's where APIs enable companies to you know enable and build products and services in in a faster time to market. So instead of them going and having to develop everything, they can actually just plug and play various um, you know microservices and products and services and and create something new out of that. So we all know that APIs are customer facing, you know, customizable software inf interfaces that allow, you know, separate components of software to be connected uh, because of these inherent uh, incompatibilities. So it makes uh, a common language of, of connecting, um, you know, uh, these APIs. So we can also think of Lego blocks. I think that is uh, the best way of kind of putting it together where the API economy has all these, these various Lego blocks that are in essence microservices. And when we connect a multitude of microservices, we end up creating an application. And um, I think that that's very valid in terms of how we plug and play and build our business models. Um, I came across this image, it is a, a bit old from taken from 2015, but nonetheless very, very relevant even still today where we look at you know how a company takes its business assets, digitizes those through web APIs and then you know that creates co co value, which then uh, creates strategic um, inputs into other applications. New business models evolve out of that, and that creates the ecosystem and the API economies, where we have these pl platforms, these marketplaces, developer portals, and storefronts that actually provide these these API um, connectors and microservices to the world. 
it's all about remaining agile. I think, you know, when we speak about the API economy, it's it's a way that you can plan and design, engage, consume, run, manage, monitor, build and iterate in a faster approach. And, you know, they, they I also saw this um, this resource, which is quite nice, where it takes you through moving from these monolithic single source applications to agile microservices connected by APIs and delivered in containers, which I'm sure was also explained a little bit further, a little bit more in the previous sessions on the other tracks um, today. But it's all about moving faster, you know, adapting uh, and also, you know, implementing these microservices and remaining agile in the iteration in creating these API products. So what are the benefits of using APIs? So benefits and drivers, we've seen COVID being a major catalyst uh, for digital transformation. So APIs have become a, a um, you know, in the slope of enlightenment, people see the value they are seeing now, you know, with a, a digital first kind of approach, how and and where those can be utilized and how new digital assets can be, can be um, you know, monetized. But also it's ecosystem economics that are at play. So that looks at the economies of scope, how new products can be created off of um, third party services, but also around improving customer services and experience. So the customer is at the heart of the process now, where continuous innovation um, allows us to deliver faster products uh, what in, in line with what customers want. And that is, you know, in essence, the, the heart of, of creating an API economy. So focus on increased efficiency as well as fast delivery so that we can actually, um, you know, monetize this and get revenue in a quicker way to market. But there are also potential risks when it comes to, to um, utilizing APIs and API marketplaces. And um, that is obviously data breach. So we need to keep that in mind. You know, you know, they, they are obviously being in the cyber domain, a lot of points of API security, which I'm sure one of these, these uh, you know, tracks will cover security in, in how to best manage those practice, practices, as well as becoming a data hostage, ironically, is where, you know, large aggregator firms end up becoming monopolies uh, because they have this critical mass of, of global digital users. And in that way, um, they dictate API uh, usage. Just in terms of open finance, that fits at the heart of, of the API economy. You know, open banking is one subset of that. Uh, I'm sure that was also touched on uh, in the previous track, so I won't spend too much time on it. But it also considers, you know, one of the, the verticals is decentralized finance. So that's DeFi and Web 3.0, as well as centralized finance or CeFi and Web 2.0. So this is kind of uh, across uh, across these sectors and these ecosystems. In terms of open banking, um, we obviously know that that this is where you know mandated uh, by law PSD two um, encourages financial institutions to share their data in third parties. So um, we can just see from points one to seven where PSD two and GDPR kind of play a role in this, but also allowing customers to remain in control and having access. Um, to, to third-party applications that would then utilize this data. Uh, I also thought I'd touch on open insurance, which is a, quite an interesting one. So it is a growing movement, but it's not mandated as of yet compared to open banking. So this would follow in the success of the footsteps of open banking, um, allowing you know, consumers to share their data with, with um, insurers or third parties in a safe, agile, accurate and convenient way. It will also touch on interoperability and integration, placing the customer at the heart of the business uh, business as well as the business process and creating amazing new use cases, you know, parametric insurance being one of them, as well as integrating third party services such as medical practitioners, auto repair uh, companies in the process. And that would give you your, obviously your insurance as a service or microservices. And they would, they would sub be subject to similar, I'm sure, requirements as um, you know, open banking, uh, something similar to a PSD2 and a GDPR equivalent. So some nations are pursuing, um, you know, open insurance. So we can see Brazil, uh, you know, SUSEP uh, issuing, you know, they just published their guidelines uh, and standards on, on open insurance. We've also got the European, insu insu the, the European Insurance and Occupational Pension Authority, um, and that works with the European Commission's digital finance strategy, exploring the use of open insurance, uh, and Italy also making some 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 uh, you know headway uh, with the API playground, the Open Insurance it, uh, Initiative in Italy. But interestingly enough, we also see Asia is leading kind of the open insurance um, way, where 
we can see like you know partnerships AIS partnerships with we doctor in, in China you know it gives access to 110 million users and obviously that's a win-win for the entity as well as uh, as as the medical practitioners for you know the smooth operation of medical insurance um, and also nationwide in risk stream exploring interesting use cases in themselves but I think most importantly you know um, World's Towers Watson's uh, report estimates that 67 percent of insurers will modify their, their business models over time. Just in terms of healthcare, um, I also just uh, sl slightly touched on this one. I'll just briefly go through this. Um, so obviously with healthcare, it's enabling better access to, to information for patients, to improve interoperability and to unleash innovation. So we can see the center of Medicare and medical services uh, rule the CMS rule is targeting U.S. Uh, health organizations in a, in a in a move to improve, you know, interoperability and integration in the sector, so that the the core of the healthcare system becomes digital. And that looks at the FHIR um, version four standards, as well as um, you know, looking at HIPAA compliance and GDPR privacy regulations. So in terms of uh, the in the the healthcare industry itself. Um, as an API economy, we can also see that um, touching on uh, these these points, telehealth, public health consent APIs, clinical data, and, and patient data would be quite important. And the implications of this is patients then are, take their healthcare data in a portable fashion, and they can even, you know, create new use cases and, and new value adds, such as, you know, customized gene therapy, um, you know, patients are, can also be remunerated for contributing their data. And, you know, new use cases are also emerging. So I know Discovery Insure, they have, a, you know, a program where you, you connect your iWatch and you get lower medical insurance premiums, the more exercise you do, as you would then be claiming less. So just going back to the API economy and how this is also starting to be facilitated with these building blocks, the Open Bank project is, is facilitating one avenue of this, which is a standard catalog of 400 APIs, banking APIs, covering several standards. It's got obviously a large uh, you know, developer community and it's open sourcing bank solution for, uh, for Web 2.0 as well as Web 3.0. So Tosobi uh, is based out of Berlin in, UK, in the UK. They started the open banking project in 2010 and obviously have large uh, customers that they work with. So they've got over 60 large financial institutions. You can see some of the well-known household names here, as well as you know, a big developer community. They, they also have dialogues with regulators as well as uh, you know, key partners, uh, API3 being one of those um, kind of building blocks in, in this equation. So with API 3, just to, to explain how we fit into the API economy and how we are working with Open Bank Project to, to make this a reality for uh, not only the Web 2.0 space, which is the traditional finance space, financial space, but also the Web 3 or decentralized financial space. Um, we have been around since 20, 2018. We, API is a decentralized autonomous organization. Uh, and obviously the limitations of the current way that APIs connect to Web 3.0 was being explored by us. So that drove us to innovate in this in this area. So we have uh, you know various integrations with multiple Ethereum virtual machine compatible blockchains um, and and uh, protocols that you know uh, an array of API providers are working with, uh, as well as uh, notable investors that have supported us. But most importantly we have entered into a 10-year partnership with the Open Bank Project to actually drive the adoption of banking APIs, open banking in the space. So our mission is to make APIs fully compatible with Web 3.0. As we also see the API economy requires, you know, with, requires glue to kind of put all these building and Lego blocks together. So if you think of it, APIs are in essence the glue of the internet. Uh, and these, uh, obviously, if you major companies, Salesforce, Google, Expedia, Uber, as mentioned before, all powered by APIs being their core business model. So Web 3.0 must be able to access all these kind of services that are currently available on, on the current web um, and interact with the real world data. So connecting APIs directly 
you know, to Web 3.0 will create new decentralized applications and use cases, digital agreement, exploring these, these markets for decentralized networks. So how does um, the, the solve one of the API economy issues? So that is the API connectivity problem. So if you were going to create, um, you know, an API based product uh, that is built on, on top of a blockchain, as an example, you would be experiencing something called the API connectivity problem. So this is due to the way that blockchains internal mechanisms achieve their consensus and they cannot natively connect to external data sources. So so that is an issue, but there are solutions out there, not the most optimal solutions uh, that work through middlemen or third party data oracles. And, you know, with any third party, your data is not secure, but also um, it, it's, it requires expert manage, management in setting these up and third parties uh, deliver this and resell the data to these API providers. So. There are risks of GDPR breaches, spillage, and unauthorized data resell by utilizing a third-party data oracle as opposed to using a first-party data oracle. So if you look at that image, you know, your current Web 2.0 API um, that wants to kind of connect to a, a new API economy, which is on Web 3.0, cannot do that uh, directly. And that's also because um, of the fact that data sharing happens through APIs. So all APIs have adapted and standards that share this data. So there's no uniform standard that's currently out there or API adapter that exists in connecting Web 2 to Web 3.0. So how is this solved in order to bridge the API economy and grow it from an existing Web 2.0 channel to a Web 3.0 channel? Um, this is where the Air node fits in uh, as an API gateway to Web 3.0. And the, the air node sits uh, in the middle as a type of middleware or API gateway that allows traditional APIs to basically be translated or provide uh, accessibility to these applications. So then these applications then can ingest and call your API directly um, as opposed to you having to create a, a new product itself. So the air node, simple to use, open source API gateway that allows APIs to connect to blockchains with 3, 3 without the active management or the use of these third parties. But most importantly, this uh, plays into the theme um, of the API economy, which is plug and play, quick to set up, set and forget. And obviously with this one specifically built on open source technology, it's free to deploy. And this allows you to also remain in full control of your data as a first party data oracle, as opposed to going through a middleman, as the, the air node is built on serverless technology. So none of the data is actually stored within, within um, the air node itself. So fully GDPR compliant when transacting within a Web 3.0 environment. And this is how um, API3 and the Open Bank project have kind of come to this partnership where we provide over 400 banking APIs, open banking APIs to Web 3.0 in a GDPR compliant manner. And this then speaks then back to the open finance, uh, you know, question and how the API economies are, are growing within that space. So, you know, obviously we know what open banking APIs do, but it's more around bridging the gap between decentralized finance and traditional finance specifically. Just a high level kind of uh, diagram that can explain the process, just if, if it's still not clear how how um, you would enable this, uh, you know, to create a new type of API economy. So we've obviously got your core banking systems and those would then provide, you know, your open finance data, uh, which are like your accounts, payments, KYC, AML data, metadata and API documentation. That would then feed through on an API layer, which is the air node, which is connected through the open bank project APIs. And that will then allow for a development of an entirely new ecosystem and new economy, which is the Web 3.0 ecosystem. And this is where Web 3.0 services can kind of grow out of it. So we're talking about self-sovereign identities, decentralized finance, which is saving and investing, uh, uting, utilizing digital assets, central bank digital currencies, which are a, you know, a growing ecosystem that would require you know, that would obviously create new use cases uh, and uh, fuel the API economies. Parametric insurance um, based on real world inputs that trigger certain outputs uh, in smart contracts uh, in these applications. Blockchain based um, app services and wallet aggregation. 
So just uh, coming close to to the end of of the presentation, um, currently, you know, the first party data solution from the Air Node then fits into the direct banking data from uh, the Open Bank project that then facilitates all of these blockchain platforms. And open insurance is something that's also being explored for Web 3.0 and beyond. Thank you so much for for that. Um, I did also want to just uh, start opening up the the floor for some questions um, and also just from my side so if there are any questions related to web 3.0 open banking or open insurance you know feel free to to reach out to me i'd be happy to have a discussion with you further on that yeah thank you giovanni so a few questions uh so if we have centralized api gateway where people pay actually for the infrastructure that's the classical model what's the business model of this Web3.0 you're building with, uh, um, let's say, AirNodes. So sorry, I couldn't hear you were breaking up. Could you just say that quickly again? Now, I said the, the business model with gateways usually is that you pay by the consumption or by the installation of the gateway and you pay kind of a license plus infrastructure cost. Mm -hmm. What is the business model with uh, decentralized uh, gateways uh, with AirNodes? Okay, perfect. So, so our business model is is a bit different. We actually, we our business model is that we provide data insurance on top of API uh, data feeds, so that they have a certain service level agreement and certain data quality. But um, in terms of of how the Airnode uses, it's built on completely open source technology, so it is completely free to use. Uh, it, but what will happen is, depending on the service provider that is that is uh, connecting their API via the Airnode to the ecosystem. Yeah that api provider would have its own kind of rules so you you could have it as a you know a paper um, a subscription model or paper use model um, that is completely up to the api provider or even a completely free model but generally when the application utilizes or calls the the service of the the api uh, those transaction fees are covered by the user itself so that it they can actually call the data from an off-chain environment into the on-chain on-chain space. I hope that that answers a bit of your question. Yeah, that that's uh, uh, that's answered the question. And so, uh, let's say what what are what were the inefficiencies in the market to be able to um, to invest into decentralizing it? Yeah, so so the inefficiencies in in the market are obviously the middleman uh, functionalities, which I think blockchain blockchain based technology always kind of considers, where you eliminate a certain middleman function. But I think in terms of that, um, obviously blockchains have other other kind of use cases, which are you know having twenty four seven uptime, uh, censorship resistance, uh, as well as uh, I think it speaks to the autonomous component of of where the world is going. So self executing pieces of code, and and it builds all of these kind of parameters uh, into this technology that then allows uh, you to innovate and create novel products. So as an example, like if you're looking at like parametric insurance which are smart contracts that require real world data inputs in order to trigger certain outputs there's no human intervention there so it's completely uh, you know it's code that that uh, calls these apis from these real world environments to then trigger certain outcomes so as an example if it's an agricultural um, insurance product and it doesn't rain um, obviously the api would be calling uh, the api of a weather service to to understand if that actually did happen or not that would then trigger the the smart contract or the automatic insurance power to the to the affected farmer so i think there's a lot of these interesting use cases and these inefficiencies as well as reducing frictional costs within bureaucracy and administration processes and this is all that this is all you know thanks to the beauty of these building blocks which we we call apis yeah Thank you very much, uh, Giovanni. It's, we're at uh, 15 past 12. Uh, thank you very much. And so if you want to know more about API3, you can go on API3 uh, uh, website and, uh, and also about Open Bank Project uh, and how they're working together. Thank you very much, Giovanni.